Um, Pei, I think, needs no, um, no introduction, but he uh, um, runs an international investment company. He made the world's first parachute jump over Mount Everest in 2008 and aims to become the first civilian Dane in space, perhaps as early as this year. But before blast off, please give us your thoughts. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Um, yes, uh, what I'd like to uh, focus on in my presentation here is the aspect of alternative energy uh, within the whole energy space and some of the problems and challenges related to alternative energy. Because when I look at the alternative energy space, uh, it's no, uh, there's no doubt whoever politician you talk to, green is good. Green works. Well, not always. And this is where the business side of things come in. It seems to me that most politicians uh, has almost a religious attitude towards green energy. If it's green, it works. It doesn't matter what it costs. It doesn't matter what it takes. It's good because I'm on the front page of the newspaper. What I'd like to do is, is instill a little bit of a business approach to this. Because in my view, green energy is truly sustainable when the businesses that operate in green energy are commercially sustainable. That's when we really start to move the needle. Because otherwise, we're going to have a lot of challenges with green energy and making the world a greener place. And those challenges uh, I've highlighted in this presentation, and they fall into eight different points, which I'll walk you through. But just very briefly, first by way of introduction, uh, I live in London, uh, I operate uh, two financial services companies, I've got my own investment bank where we focus on green energy, as well as oil and gas and mining, so all natural resources where we do financings all over the world. I also have an asset management company, Wimmer Family Office, uh, where we invest on behalf of high net worth individuals uh, and, and wealthy families. And then uh, Waymo Space, where some of the slightly more exciting uh, parts of my life, such as uh, my uh, uh, world uh, record, when uh, together with Ralph Mitchell, I became the first person to skydive Mount Everest back in 2008. I wish I could talk more about that here, but I can't. Um, next year, uh, ho hopefully by the end of this year or early next year, uh, I'm hoping to become the first Dane in space, uh, courtesy of my three space missions, one of which, which was, is with uh, Richard Branson, I'm a founding astronaut with his program, as well as XCOR and Space Adventures. So I've got three trips coming up uh, starting uh, next year. Uh, we also do a lot of charity within Women's Space, so we support kids and schools around, around uh, the place and team up with various uh, charity organizations to do the right thing. However, the purpose of the talk here today, as I said, is really about green, uh, green energy. And let me set the backdrop a little bit about the landscape, the world we live in, really from a almost above Everest point of view. So looking at the globe and looking forward, what you can see here is just a snapshot on how some leading economists expect the global GDP, the global world economy to develop over the next few years. Uh, the first slide here is, is looking back and the next one is looking up towards 2025. And what's interesting to see here, if you look at the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia and China as a proxy for emerging markets, it is very clear that those countries, the emerging markets, they are industrializing, they are creating urbanization, and they're driving GDP up. And that process, ladies and gentlemen, that process is unstoppable. They now have the opportunity to do what we do, what we have done for many, many generations, enjoy a good and prosperous life. And they are not going to stop buying cars, using energy, using raw material. And that process will have a very transformational effect on the global energy picture going forward. Another way of looking at it is just stripping out China specifically, and we would take a further look out to 2050. Look at this sort of almost rocket-like graph that we have here with China, if you look at GDP, expected GDP growth in China. Yes, it's not going to be a straight line, maybe not as straight as this, there will be bumps along the way, and maybe we're going through a little bit of a bumpy road at the moment, but the road is clear. China is industrializing. China today is consuming, for instance, 40% of all copper in the whole world. Same with zinc, same with nickel. Pick any metal almost. China is now leading this 
And that, in turn, once they've built their buildings and they've built their roads, there'll be cars on them and there'll be energy consumption, and that comes right on the tail of it. And that's what you see right here. Here, what I've done is we've stripped out the OECD countries and the non-OECD countries, and we looked at energy demand across the globe. And it's quite clear to see that the non-OECD countries really are picking up the pace here. This is changing the world energy landscape. We will be consuming much more energy, and something has to be done. I'm not necessarily talking about peak oil theories here, or we're running out of oil, because there's plenty of oil around. It's just a matter of about how much do you want to pay for it? How deep do you want to go into the sea? How much capex do you want to spend? So there's energy around. That's the good news. But this is more from a policy point of view. How are you going to tackle this? How are you going to tackle this challenge? And if we want less CO2, what about green energy? What are we going to do? One thing that is for sure that will emerge as part of this greater growth of energy demand is that along the way, there will be bubbles. There will be bubbles they'll be building. There will be inefficiencies. There will be subsidies needed. There will be uh, artificial things that will distort the market. And I have previously um, uh, expressed myself in, in a book format on, on these types of bubbles. Uh, Two, two years ago, I published a book called uh, Wall Street, where I looked into the financial markets and some of the problems we had in the dot-com area, as well as dot-com one area, I should say, and also the credit bubble. And um, here in June, I'll be publishing a book here in Sweden called The Green Bubble, which highlights some of the challenges and the problems that I see in the green um, uh, area uh, at the moment. Um, specifically, we are right now, again, unfortunately, going through a technology bubble so, uh, so this technology bubble, combined with the green bubble, uh, will have uh, negative implications and has a potential risk for adverse effects, such as uh, the effects we saw during the credit bubble. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about technology, but when I do see uh, WhatsApp being sold for $19 billion with 55 employees, there's something wrong in this world. There's something wrong. And you can go through the list uh, of all these billion-dollar deal M&A transactions in the technology space. So for those of you who own technology shares, please go short straight away. Uh, look at something like Facebook, trading at 75 times earnings. Facebook is not a, a small company. It's a, it's a fairly big company. It's got a market cap of $145 uh, billion. It's not going to grow that fast. There is something wrong. But this, just in technology, same in energy, there's a tendency sometimes to get carried away when things are growing, when things are going too fast. And that we will see also in the green energy space, I'm afraid. If we look at the, uh, in a, we take the top five countries in Europe and we look at the absolute levels for subsidies, here are the projections that are expected to happen in terms of subsidy levels uh, from today and all the way to 2020 where we expect them to grow from about 32 billion euros to about 47 billion. So this is a, there's no doubt that green energy is growing because politicians religiously want green energy. But it's you, ladies and gentlemen, and I, who are going to fund this thing through taxes. And therefore, as a taxpayer, I would like to see proper green bang for my buck. Green bang for my buck, meaning that it has to be done in a very efficient way, not just something that put, puts politicians on the front page at my expense. Now, the challenge, uh, as I said, with green energy, and there is eight of them I'm going to highlight to you here today. So this is a problem we have to address and find solutions for, and I hope this forum can, can, can maybe address some of these things. But, but some of the problems that we have with green energy contrasted with classic energy is, for instance, uh, the capital cost these things tend to be quite expensive. If you look at what's in, inside the red frame, these, these are the green energy technologies, and if you look at the things here on the left, those are the classic technologies. And it's quite clear that it is cheaper dollar per kilowatt to build classic energy than to, than to build green energy. So we've got to find a way to lower those costs. Or perhaps even better, maybe we should focus on those technologies where we can see a path to making it commercially sustainable within, say, four or five years, instead of wasting money and energy on things that will never, never come, come true. 
what we see is a lot of projects that get funded that, that quite frankly, ought not to be funded. Uh, but because it's green, you can't argue against it. It's religion. An example from uh, another example that, that also comes out of the political uh, subsidy raise, as it were. Uh, I've taken an example here from the UK, which is just, just to highlight a specific point, and that is that when you create different bands for various levels of energy, for instance, in the UK, if you have in a, a wind turbine that produces between 100 and 500 kilowatt, you get about uh, 16, 17 uh, uh, p per kilowatt. Um, whereas if you have a bigger turbine, you get less. Now the problem is, if you take something like Gamesa, they, they've got an 850 kilowatt turbine. That, had, that turbine had to be made less efficient in order to be deployed in the UK. Now that can't be a good thing. They had to take it down to 500 in order to capture the higher levels of subsidies. That cannot be a good thing. So these are some of the perverse effects that sometimes happens when you try to distort the market through subsidies. And the challenge here is to make the subsidies I'm not against subsidies, it's okay for a period of say four to five years, but at some point it's got to phase out so we get rid of these effects. Another challenge is the capacity challenge, something which the previous panel talked about. And the problem is that most of the green energies, uh, they tend to be, uh, the solar panel only works when the sun is shining, the wind only works about a third of the time at best, i.e. when the wind is, 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 is there, whereas some of the classic energy, they can provide base load. Obviously, things like hydro, if you're lucky enough, like in a place like Sweden where there's rivers, um, that can be very, very helpful. But we can't count on that because that's not the case everywhere. And this is a real challenge because you've got to have the backup capacity, whether it's gas, like in Germany, and therefore relying on the Russians for 34% of their supply, which is not particularly helpful these days. Um, and it's also expensive with backup capacity. So this is a real problem for green energy. Another problem is that if you look at uh, the green energy projects on, on average, they tend to be very leveraged. We put a lot of, as a financier, we put a lot of debt into these things because, because we can, because they're typically guaranteed by 20-year contract or 10-year contract supported by, uh, by the nation state or by states. Um, the problem though is that if you invest into projects that are not commercially sustainable and will not become commercially sustainable within the next 10, 15 years, and there are such projects out there, and you then lever them up, at some point, somebody's going to get tired. I'm afraid. That's fine. That's fine. We'll get there. Somebody's going to get tired, and therefore, the leverage will kick in, and this will all come crumbling down, I'm afraid. And in particular now, where the interest rate environment is rising, as you can see here, there's a real problem uh, because the cost of debt will be rising and therefore the subsidies will be required even more. And that's a problem for the politicians. Like I said, also, the, the other problem is, is most green energy uh, projects are not, um, are not baseload, so they will fluctuate and therefore you need the backup capacity. And fifthly, you need to expand the whole transmission grid because typically the green energy projects are sitting in places away from civil, where, the, where the towns are, where the energy is needed. You can't just build uh, a power plant here. The wind is wherever the wind is and you'll have to build extra transmission grids. And here's an example from the US. The red lines here highlight that if the US wanted to go for 20% 20, 20 wind energy, this is how much you would have to build in terms of extra uh, energy grid in, in terms of trans transmissions. And that comes with a very, very big expense. The other problem, and this is the sixth challenge within the green energy space, is obviously it lives in the market. And what we have seen in the US, for instance, is the emergence of shale gas, which is very cheap and cheerful. And therefore, it creates some market challenges for green energy because it typically is more expensive. And therefore, it's more difficult to make it commercially sustainable. Uh, we've seen it also with corn, when bioethanol was, was very popular. We see here, this is the corn prices really, really affected by the emergence of subsidies uh, within the bioethanol space. Look how, how big effect this can have on markets if we really go in big time and say we want to have biofuel and we want to use food crops for, for these purposes. The, the other challenge, this is number seven, is the financing challenge. A lot of these projects requires a lot of capital. They're very capital intensive. <clears throat> and most of it get levered up quite, quite nicely. 
But when stock prices are fairly low, as you can see, this is Vestas, for instance, here, and these are other green energy companies, except Yingli, the Chinese. The Chinese obviously are supporting their companies very artificially, so they get a, a helping hand, and that's why they've been holding up okay. But when equity values are quite low, uh, it becomes also a challenge to expand the whole green energy space. And then finally, there still are some very se severe challenges when it comes to technology. Uh, I've taken some wave energy projects here, which just seems to have a very difficult time to make themselves commercially sustainable and therefore truly uh, worthy of being green energy, unless we have to support them for years and years and years to come. So therefore, uh, we need to find a solution where we can make the whole green energy space a lot more uh, commercially sustainable, get away from this religious attitude towards green energy and approach in a much more business-like manner and put on the business glasses and therefore focus on things that can be made commercially sustainable, such as hydro, such as wind, if you take big wind, wind turbines at six megawatts and place them in the right place, as well as nuclear, as Hans Blix uh, very uh, cogently argued earlier today, there's a very strong case for nuclear and it has to be part of our energy mix and certainly also some of the solar farms. With that, I think we are on a path to finding a solution, but it is not going to be an easy road, I'm afraid, and there's some serious challenges ahead. I want to see that we're going to put in more green energy, but we have to do it in a much different way than we're doing it today, because today, this whole attitude about green energy being religion, it ain't going to work, because it's not sustainable. And if we continue like that, the bubble will burst. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pear. And while you're taking a seat, I'm going to introduce our panellists, who I'm sure will have some um, very cogent points to make in response to your, um, in, to your, your, your presentation. Um, starting from my far right, we have uh, Stefan Zinger, who is the energy expert for what I was brought up to call the World Wildlife Fund, but is now, I think, just WWF as a sort of short... Um, the, it's a, the, perhaps the be, be, best-known environmental um, charity and campaigning group in, 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 in the world. And he's been there since 2008. And before that, um, he was uh, head of climate policy um, at WWF Germany, and before that, working in Hyderabad in India. Um, then we have um, another Stefan, Stefan Döhler, who uh, um, told me just before this that he knows the um, German wind industry inside out, but he's now um, head of the uh, nuclear energy division at Axpor and uh, CEO of a nuclear power plant called Leibstadt and Besnau in, uh, in, in, in Germany. And then we also have Mark Howells, who is a professor of energy systems analysis and a policy advisor to the um, European Commission. So I think I, I'm going to go to you first from Stefan Singer on the far end um, to ask you for your um, response to what uh, Wim was uh, presenting. Do you see um, a green energy bubble? How would you respond to the idea that the green energy gets three different sorts of subsidy? You get a subsidy as a feed-in tariff, um, you get a subsidy because the, uh, someone has to balance the intermittency of the green um, energy if it's weather dependent, and also someone has to pay for the grid, for the poles and wires across which the, uh, the energy flows. Over to you. To the brook. To the brook. Just, just speak. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> how much time do I have for my introductory remarks? Three minutes? Two minutes? Well, say five, five to ten, depends. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, a couple of points. Thanks for this um, interesting and um, um, challenging presentation. I'm not talking about religion here. Because I think that's private business, and I don't think it helps if we consider some of the um, problems we are facing indeed with renewables, um, calling them religious. I don't think that's the case. But I think, Pierre, I think we need to put things into context. I think it's fundamentally, strategically, and politically wrong <coughs> to talk about support schemes for renewables, which tend to, based on the European Court of Justice, which tend to compensate for externalities which are not covered. We still have the situation that... Um, we have not a proper carbon price. Um, we have not a proper compensation um, for um, the proliferation or the treatments of waste of nuclear. Still, the state has to do that one. So the, the European Court of Justice has said feed-in tariffs um, are justified, support schemes are justified, um, because they are so-called um, compensation schemes. That's the first thing, formally. But I don't want to go into that one. Um, my point is, let's, let's employ a bigger picture here. 
Um, if we talk about the scandalous subsidies for renewables, which you said are between 25 and 60 billion in Europe, sounds a lot, but are dismal and negligible um, compared to the fossil fuel subsidies we see in the world. According to the International Monetary Fund, which is not WWF or Greenpeace or relying on a green religion, um, has said annually, annually and rising, fossil fuel subsidies are about two trillion per year. Compared to those, the support schemes for renewables, I would say, are too small to meter. Um, those are the problems of the market. If we talk about leveraging um, substantively commercially viable clean energies, renewable energies, and energy efficiency, I like to add, then we need to address market failures. Market failures have not led, and this is also what Lord Stern said, the former chief economist of the World Bank, when he wrote in 2008, I think one of the first big companions on the assessment on, on economics of climate change, when he as an economist said, I'm not an economist, I'm a physicist, but he said as an economist, climate change is the biggest market failure we see. The market is not there to solve the climate change problem unless we change the underlying circumstances, rules, and framing. We see in fossil fuels, despite Kyoto, despite Rio, we see in fossil fuels investments in the last 10 years an increase from about 300 billion US dollar annually to up to 1.1 billion US dollar, um, both upstream and downstream. Um, those are the numbers we need to talk about, and not about the 20 or 30 billion um, subsidies for renewables, which are there, but which are new and which work in many cases. And I can tell you a lot about Germany. I'm not doing that one here because I think that would be a long standing debate here. Um, we have problems in Germany. Um, we have problems in other countries with renewables, but they work. And interestingly, developing countries, and you talk correctly about the, um, the challenges we see with developing countries with necessary and legitimate GDP growth to overcome poverty. I fully agree on that one. Um, but we see also in those countries that the, the race to green energy, to renewables, is happening there. And by the way, not because of climate change, because it makes economic sense. It creates jobs, it addresses externalities like health, which is a big issue in countries like India or South Africa. Uh, it addresses jobs. Um, giving you an example from South Africa, a coal dependent country, very coal dependent. South Africa was in the last two years the biggest investor in renewables worldwide in terms of efforts, not in absolute terms, this was China, but in terms of GDP. 0.8 to 0.9 percent of GDP equivalent was invested in solar and wind only in South Africa because it makes economic sense for these guys, not because of climate change. We see similar movements coming up in Brazil. Um, similar things in, in India. So the, the, the overall, I would say, focus and emphasis on investments in clean energy, in this case renewables, um, is moving out of the OECD, which you see is also with the investment figures, um, is going to developing countries, which is a good movement. Um, solar PV, decentralized solar PV, is without subsidies, without subsidies, in many cases of the world, now cheaper than subsidized diesel generators or kerosene in many developing countries. Not everywhere, but we have a couple of examples of India, of Africa, where solar PV works in, com in competition to subsidize kerosene and solar, perversely enough. Um, energy efficiency, one word. Um, the market energy efficiency, unfortunately, doesn't work. The IEA has assessed, um, has assessed that currently, and it's growing, worldwide we're investing about 150 billion US dollars in, in energy efficiency services, mainly demand-side products, energy-efficient cars, good appliances, LED lighting, et cetera, et cetera. That sounds big, 150 billion, or 190 billion, I think, numbers are in, in that order of magnitude. But they also say it's a market failure because the cost-effective investments, which would guarantee a twice payback over a lifetime of the project or the pr product, would justify investments of 500 to 600 billion. The market is not there. They're infrastructural, political, not technical and other barriers who prevent from things to happen which make economic sense. That's my point. I think we should, talk, we should not talk about the so-called um, uneconomic subsidy support schemes for renewables if we just lose out the bigger picture. We don't see the forest before the trees, unfortunately. The biggest problems are the market failures on, on allowing and, and growing investments in fossil fuels um, and, and the other stuff is, I think, necessary to help, and costs are going down for renewables substantively, and I would like to talk later a little bit about new business models, um, because we believe that um, the substantive cost reductions, particularly in decentralized PV, 
um, will create disruptive business models for many utilities. Utilities who are in the room here, including Vattenfall, but also RWE and DESA, American utilities, with a couple of interesting developments, unless they address those challenges and those changes. Um, McKinsey has worked on that one. Recently, they, they, they released a quite interesting paper. I wouldn't have expected this from McKinsey, but they want the utilities and says, by the way, the economists had a piece on that one a couple, of, a couple of months ago as well, but they were very critical on the current business model of utilities, accusing them of not taking up the challenge. Um, but we can talk about this separately. Last point on the grids. Yes, I agree with you on the grid challenge. We as WWF work with grid companies in Europe um, to address those issues, and, and we are not part of the NIMBYs. We support grid expansion, grid enhancement, because we need it for, by the way, variable renewables. They're not intermittent. Intermittent is nuclear, it's on or off. Re renewables are not on or off. They, var they vary over time, they're weather dependent. So I think, I think jargon is important here. Um, the IA, and I'm working a little bit with the IA, the IA has a very interesting project with many utilities, with many grid companies across the OECD. And they've assessed that with proper grid planning, and if grid planning is part from the onset of a renewable energy project, the grid costs are about less than 4% at worst, in some cases only 2% of proper expansion of variable renewables. We have seen that not happening in the past. I agree, China has paid a big price for that one. They ticked the box. They had their five years plans on gigawatt power in, in wind power, and they forgot the connection um, with the grids. They do that now, but they pay the price for it. And I think that's the lesson we can learn, and the same is with the US. It, the US is starting not on wind at this point in time, because wind is going down in the US, but on solar, they start with the utilities in Colorado, but also in Florida and in, in, in California in particular, to integrate um, more and more, and I think it starts also in Europe, to integrate the balance of the power, we talked about this in the former panel, um, to integrate the load management of those variable, not often very predictable, um, load in the grid, and it works. Um, and it worked, by the way, last point, in Germany, people were talking about the big costs of Germany. Don't let's forget, in Germany we have, I'm not speak, spokesperson for the German government, but this is also addressing the other panel. Um, I think we didn't have blackouts and brownouts. We have about 26% variable renewables, wind and solar. I think we have great work of the grid companies, and if you talk, and I would have wished we would have grid companies from Germany here, we have to manage this difficult situation and this load. And they would tell you, if we wouldn't have had the possibility to do proper grid management and load management, we wouldn't be able to do it. We can do it, but it's possible because um, the technolo te technological potentials are there, which are often underestimated. So we can manage rural power quite substantively to a quite high amount, but again, I agree, we need to have good grid and load management, which is a political issue, not just a technical issue. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jean-Bert, indeed, for that. It's, it's not your fault, but your microphone is slightly in the wrong place. If you could just push it down a little bit. Um, that would be just push the top of the microphone down a few okay. inches before. That, that's better. Then you'll, we'll, we'll hear you better. Good. I'm going to go straight over to um, Stefan Dürler now. Um, you've, you've seen the industry at both ends, both, the, um, both from wind and now nuclear. How do, how do you see the, the, the... What's the right business model? Can we have a real business model when every single element of this is got some kind of either government in interference or unpriced externality. Yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, it's, it's right indeed. I, I'm uh, in both businesses as uh, managing director of, of three nuclear power plants and uh, former uh, member of the board and, and being a, a member of the advisory board of one of the largest uh, German wind power companies. Uh, just make, let me make one, one correction. Uh, uh, Betts now and Leipzig are in Switzerland. Yes. <coughs> so I'm coming out of Switzerland. You said Germany, maybe it doesn't. Not a big thing. But the interesting point here is uh, Switzerland is, is uh, very much depending on the German market. So, <coughs> and, and, uh, so I think a German uh, has a very big influence on the, on the European market as a whole. So, and just one example, if we look at the spread between the price at the exchange in Frankfurt and end consumer price, so this gives us already an idea that there's something not in the balance. So the, the market at the exchange at the moment is about 34 euro per megawatt hour, and end consumer price varies from 250 to 290 euro per megawatt hours. The end consumer pays more than 60, 70% of the price. It's not production and not transmission. It is everything else. Mm -hmm. That's just one point. And <clears throat> there is a, a major influence from the not anymore working so-called merit order curve. The merit order curve reflecting in the past 
the balance between uh, demand and production is, is out of balance. There are, are, are reasons for that. What I would like to say is <clears throat> this is not just simply because we installed renewable energy. Renewable energy uh, makes sense to install. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the question here is what is the geo geopolitical framework of this? Where does it make sense and what does make sense? So, I mean, and there is a difference between Spain and the north of Norway, for example. So if you talk about uh, photovoltaic, for example. So, and, and a wind power is a mature type of production, there's no doubt about it. But again, here, it doesn't make sense each and everywhere. So uh, it doesn't make sense, for example, to install wind power in the Alps. And, and a country like Switzerland, for example, is not an ideal country for wind power. It is just not. So, and, and these are things, these are boundary conditions we have to take into account. And what you said, Mr. Wimmer, which is, has not been taken place, unfortunately, because it was just a run uh, towards, not a technology, not a common sense, but it was towards a religion thought. This is really the case. And one important point, what I see is, uh, again, we, we don't talk about technology in most of the cases. And one reason why we we run into this unbalanced market is that the ground rules for the subsidies had not been defined at the beginning. What means for how long will we, an ever more substantial part of the market, subsidize? I mean, we could discuss, of course, the other subsidies you just mentioned, but I mean, it's, it's just the fact that we subsidize now the new renewable energies with about six to seven euro cent per kilowatt hours. It is just what it is in Germany. I'm referring most of the time to Germany. And so, and the question here is what are the real production costs for renewables we are going to reflect on the market? This is what we have to look for. And one decisive part of all this system is CO2. And it's the price of CO2. And, and so there we failed completely. The price of CO2 is absolutely not reflecting the importance of CO2. There is another problem which led at the end of the day that the today's market price is made by lignite in Germany. And by the way, uh, I have a slide we could have a look later. Germany at the moment is producing more than 50% with lignite and hard coal. So the so-called back, backload capacity is very high and it is made out of coal. This is what, what we see. And at the same time, large hydropower plants are going down the train. So, so the, the actually one uh, n renewable energy we had from the past is now losing money. We are losing on every kilowatt hour out of hydro, we are losing money at the moment. So the question is, is this good? Is this common sense? It is not, of course. But there is no market mechanism to stop this nonsense. And, and this is where we are at the moment. I think I, I would like to stop at this point so there are a lot of uh, possibilities for discussion. and. Uh, this is just, a, let's say, the, the first statement. Well, thanks very much indeed for highlighting those um, contradictions. And I am very keen to have questions from the audience as well. So if you want to make a point, do just catch my eye. I shall be looking around every now and again. Just wave. We have roving microphones which will be come to you, and you can either make a comment or ask a, ask a question. But I'm now going to turn to um, Mark, Mark, Mark Howells. Um, from, your, from your perspective, um, how, do you, how do you see the potential for a realistic business model that would encompass all the different um, issues and topics we've been talking about? Well, I'd, uh, I'd like to start with, uh, and this has nothing to do with uh, being a male living in Sweden, but every morning I make my wife coffee. And this is a, an essential ingredient in, a, in what, I would, what I'd consider a very happy marriage right now. Now, the thing is, is just, just to put this into a little bit of perspective, I mean, if we decide to choose a particular coffee machine and we say this is the means by which we're going we're gonna to make our coffee, coffee. And for argument's sake, I'm going to say it's similar to an intermittent renewable energy source. And we've decided to do this. And I come down in the morning, and I press the button to, to make coffee in this machine, and nothing comes out. There's a crisis. There's going to be war if there's no secure supply of coffee. So I have to run out, get whatever I can, do whatever I have to. If I'm Germany, I go buy coal from uh, the United States to generate electricity in this, this time when I'm not being, it's not being produced by renewables. In my case, I'll go and, uh, and get a plunger and, and, and make some coffee very quickly. And there'll be costs involved in that that aren't necessarily reflected at all. And the suggestion and the idea is simply that we, we need to get the signals in the market and the prices, uh, prices correct. 
we need security of supply, security of coffee supply, but we also need um, markets that are there to help with the balancing. When, when our technology of choice is not available, do we have others that are there? And is there, is there the regime there to, to enable the sorts of investments that are required? But lastly, I'd like to get to the point that our objective is good, fresh coffee. We should maybe take a step back from the means of getting there. We've been obsessed with technologies. I hear the economists say that you're pro-nuclear. Uh, other people saying that they're pro-renewables. Well, actually, I'm pro-secure, low-cost, clean electricity that helps us, um, helps us develop sustainably. I had three quick slides, if I could bring them up uh, just, just super fast. Okay, so just, just to say, there are, there are some key drivers that are going to affect our markets. We heard about uh, developing economies and urbanization. This is critical. Energy security is going to become important into the future. Some people will argue that we're, we're running out of resources. Whether that's the case or not is, 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 is arguable, but certainly there are supply constraints coming. We require energy. Energy powers our societies. But in order to generate that energy, we need water. At the same time, in order to supply water, we, we need to, uh, to use energy to do that. And food is the same. We need um, uh, energy and water. But at the same time, if we're looking at biofuels, there's a competition there. Uh, we could either produce food or we could produce biofuel. And uh, what, what are, what are the, 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 complexity, the complexities there that we need to have a look at and unpack? Um, there are a few, but I'd argue that this is going to be an important driver. We fought wars over food, energy, and water in the past. We will again in the future, and, um, and this needs to be brought into our, into our thinking. At the moment, we're in a space where I'd say we've had a bit of luxury. Uh, there's a relatively over-designed electricity uh, system that's, coming to a, that's becoming constrained. We've had a, a glut of easily available resources for a fair amount of time. And uh, we see constraints coming, and how we deal with those in an integrated way is going to be crucial. Uh, next slide, perhaps. Um, there was, a, there was another slide. Oh, next. sorry, is this a, okay, great, great. Uh, the other thing is, and I, I was a little, um, it's, it was intriguing hearing the, the comments from the, uh, the, the current CEO of, of Vattenfall, uh, a little bit earlier on, especially with the, the beautiful electric Volvo out of there, which by pure coincidence appears up there too. And if Volvo ever wants to sponsor my division with a, a demonstration, you're more than welcome to. But we, we, we see that there is going to be a move simply away from electricity and energy and other things to services. Nobody here has a pocket full of coal or a pocket full of, uh, of nuclear power or a solar panel in your pocket. Maybe you do, but if you do, please don't say anything right now. The thing is, is that we don't really need the energy. We want the services. And there's a large opportunity to start charging for services and markets developing to look at services that suit our needs. There was this uh, comment, which I, I think was kind of telling, uh, about this idea that you, know, you, might want to, you might not want to cook at a particular time in the evening if that price is high all of a sudden. The price of electricity is high. But sure, if you buy your services from a company and that company says, don't worry, we'll make sure that you can cook at a particular price and, and, and so on, and it'll be cheaper for what you're doing right now, that company can have the asset portfolio in the background to do all of its balancing. If it's got a carbon accounting, it can enter a carbon market and do a whole bunch of other things and just optimize the system far more dynamically than this old-fashioned view of a large utility and the consumer. And I'm afraid we're, we're kind of caught a little bit. Although the electricity markets in Europe have been deregulated for a long time, there is still this sense, a very strong sense of a, a kind of social contract to keep the lights on. And, and we sort of need to, we need to move away from, from that being the responsibility of the, the utility, which is happening, and start to think about what kind of regulations we could set up to make sure that services are supplied and the various market mechanisms and market players that are, that are around can do this. Um, I like the, one of the things that's special here, and the technology has been around for, for a relatively long time, but the truth is, is that right now, we can aggregate information very easily because lots of people can use apps on mobile phones to control all kinds of services at, at the minute. But at the same time, these enter our, our lives 
much, easy, much more easily than they did years ago. Years ago, people were talking about smart meters. This is going to make a difference. People will see how much they're paying for electricity and change their behavior patterns. In an experiment done in a suburb in London when there was an early rollout of smart meters, people in winter realized that they were paying so little to heat their houses that they took their jerseys off, put on the, the Bermuda t-shirts and shorts, and just cranked up the electricity supply, which I have to say is not necessarily a bad thing, because if the market structured correctly, and we have the externalities properly priced in there, including uh, market balancing externalities as well as environmental costs and so on, fine, the market will decide. The issue is getting the right kind of market rules in place. I try and explain this to, to my students a little bit, but I want to just end off with energy efficiency. You know, um, people have been talking about the potential of energy efficiency for a long time, but there's a very simple market failure that would easily be, addre be addressed by utilities or uh, bodies selling services as opposed to selling electricity, which is an intermediary. Okay? Um, if there's anybody here that likes a, a nice cold, uh, cold beer and you have to buy a couple of light bulbs at the shop, uh, this is a, an example my students relate to, by the way, and you have to go buy a couple of light bulbs. You've got the choice of buying a couple of high efficiency, compact uh, LEDs that are gonna last for 10 years and over their lifetime, you know, three years into their lifetime, they'll pay themselves back and you'll be making money and so on. Or you buy a couple of cheap incandescents, we can do that in Sweden, and uh, <coughs> buy a beer, what are you gonna do? I mean, obviously they're gonna buy the two cheap incandescents and get the beer because they don't, they, they don't have the means to, to do the aggregation and to uh, think about the implications of paying a service. But if um, Fortum Osram were to say, you yeah, know, here's a catalog of life bulbs, go along, choose how you want to do your lighting and so on, you buy the service as opposed to the, um, as opposed to the electricity and they can guarantee lower cost services because you can optimize the system better. You have a new market with a huge amount of new potential. And we see signs of that now. And I would, I would argue we need the market rules correct, yes. And uh, if they're done in a structured, sensible way, we see the potential for a lot new investment that's potentially a whole lot more environmentally friendly than, than what we see now. I thought you were going to say that if you buy the energy efficient light bulb, you get given a free beer. Uh, there, are, there are different incentives, but I w if, if you know my students, that, that will make his uh, curve of increasing subsidies look uh, pretty, pretty mild. You'll get a, a lot of purchases <laughs> of high efficiency light bulbs for the free beer. Yes, but if you were selling the light bulb and the lighting service on a 10-year contract, you could afford to give people quite a lot of beer for the... But that, that's exactly the, the point. Now, yes, that's exactly that's the point. That's what I was saying, yes. yeah. um, Good. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're dying to respond to the... Um, points that were made earlier. You've been very patient. I'll give you, I'll give you a chance to dive back in again. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. It's always good with a good debate and, and, and uh, opposite views and things. So, but I think the, the, the real challenge it really boils down to deep down is that the world needs more energy. We've got to fix how to do it. If we want less CO2, we've got to go in with something that really has bang for the buck. And, and at the moment, a lot of the various technologies we have, whether it's wave or even solar, unfortunately, even wind and things like that, they're still fairly narrow in terms of their contribution to the global energy supply, unfortunately. So we're going to have to really focus on the things that really gives you big green bang for the buck, as it were. And uh, unfortunately, at the moment, uh, the, the, there aren't that many choices. Uh, I guess there's mainly three areas where, where, where they are obvious at the moment. One, one, is, one is hydro, as we talked a lot about, uh, and maybe an area there, if the prices are too low, is maybe for a bit of subsidies on, on the big capex uh, when you build these things, because once it's built, it just keeps rolling, and, 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 and the opex over time, in most cases, come down to a reasonable level, and it's base load, and it's green, and what have you. So uh, few negatives on, on, on that one. Um, the other one is nuclear. Uh, you really have got, if you want to have a green world, uh, you cannot avoid nuclear at this present time, whether through uranium or thorium, etc. Thorium is obviously promising, but it's still a little bit out, unfortunately. But, but nuclear is, uh, as, as Hans was explaining earlier, it, it really gives you a lot of energy, concentrated energy, in a very concentrated place. Uh, just don't build it on earthquake zones, you know, Japan, case in point but it, it can really have a big effect. Um, the key thing here is to address um, or the two challenges with nuclear. One is the capex again, up front, 
big capex, 3 billion euros uh, up in Finland and counting. So maybe that's an area for subsidies where we can really go in and make a difference. And, and the second one is obviously waste disposal. What are we going to do with it? Yes, it will decay, but it does take a long time. So we've got to focus on, on, on waste disposal uh, effective solutions, and then nuclear can become a bigger uh, part of the pie. And then also efficiency, energy savings, efficiency. It is today actually about 50% of the whole green energy market in Europe, so it is actually a pretty meaningful part of the market, whether it's LED lighting or, or what have you. And there's a strong business case there, and it certainly has to be part of the mix, but it is not the only solution. Uh, but those would be the three areas I would highlight as, as sort of big areas where we can really make a big difference. And all the other nice little things uh, where we do experiments and we try, it is, the, in my view, the role of the state to subsidize that, not directly necessarily through to companies that, go, that, that tries and it fails and they go bust and whatever. The better way to do that is to allocate more R&D money to universities, technical universities. Put the money there. There's a lot of talent there. Things go wrong. At least a lot of people have become a lot wiser. And if things go right, business model can flow from there and somebody will commercialize it. So that's a better way to channel the R&D money. But this is a very rational approach. It's not necessarily front page coverage political approach. And that's what we need to change. Thank you. Anyone here from a university wants to jump in and, um, on, on that subject and uh, give us an insight from that end about whether you think that's the right way of doing it, you'd be very, very welcome. Um, Stefan Singer. Thank you. Um, I think in the interest of, of time and interest of a uh, um, debate which is not running in a dead end, I'm not talking about nuclear here. I think our position on nuclear is pretty clear here. Um, so I take your point, but we have a different thing. I don't want to go into detail here. I just, let's put it this way. I fully agree with your point you made earlier on um, ESCOs, energy service companies, including services as a part of incentive, or let's say a kind of um, outsourced investments by someone else, and you get the benefits and you share the economic gains huh? but between, a, let's say, an ESCO, a utility, or whatever, a project developer is, and the household who gets the LED and still has money to buy its good beer. So I'm with you on that one. I want to have the beer and the LED. Um, being a German, I think I have to say that. Um, so I, I think that's a model. The point is, there was a proposal, I think there were three proposals a couple of years ago, as we were European here, by the European Commission, on, on, on creating um, incentives, not mandatory, incentives for energy service companies, it was heavily fought by the utilities. They didn't want it. They said, it's not our job. Our job is to buy, it's, it's to sell kilowatt hours, period. We agree that's not the right way, and I think turning, turning the circle into new business models. Utilities have seen in the last years decline of their market shares. They have seen decline of the equity value. They have seen problems of getting equity on the market, um, whereas other actors in the energy market have grown, in particular grid companies, which may be in the future also independent power producers in a fully liberalized European electricity market as well as in the US. We don't know where they're going. Some think about it like Tenet or 50 Hertz in Germany. Think about this one. They wouldn't be stopped to do that. They could do that, actually. And that's quite interesting. Well, so we will see new actors. And then the utilities also have to think about what is their um, value on the market. And I think I would agree with you, selling services, in this case electricity, would be much better than just selling kilowatt hours. That's my first point. Second point on R&D. I, I agree with you on R&D. Uh, it's very important. I think no one would speak against R&D. The point is, it becomes a little bit critical if R&D is put against um, experiences on the ground and investments on the ground, because I think we have to act now. And we have seen lots of improvements in technologies, not only cost declines, but we have seen improvements in, in, in load factors. Wind, for instance, had substantive reduction in load factor because of the huge investments in onshore wind. In the beginning, the load factor was about 15, 20%, and now everything remaining the same was repowering. You see that not only in Sweden or in Germany, in many cases, repowering new windmills coming in have load factor which is about 50, 60% higher than before. Offshore wind, the first offshore wind parks um, in, in, in Europe, and I would wish we would do more on offshore wind because I think we'd also need not only decentralized and small, we need also big and centralized. I agree with you on that one. On offshore wind, projected, the initial offshore wind parks had a projected load factor, capacity factor of something like 45, 46%. This was considered, oh, that's the industry, you know, they, they, they paint the figures nice. Observed figures on existing offshore wind parks, I know they're not that many yet in Europe, but some are there, 
are in last year, or were in last year, 51%. So, so okay. load factor, because you put the stuff on the ground, you make experience. The same as solar. Some of the PV stuff, which is which are on the roofs, highly expensive in the beginning. I agree with you. Costs went down. Load factor increased. Of course, the limit is the night. Then, then, but then we could talk. In, in, we, we, need to talk uh, we need to talk about batteries, uh, battery system. I, I think R&D is one point. The other point is, is implementation. Okay. Um, that's, I think, very important. Thanks. Um, can we have the microphone down here at the um, front, front table, um, please, for um, uh, Professor Kel Akhlet? Thanks. And can I just ask you while the microphone's coming, is WWF against nuclear power? Yes. Right, okay. You didn't completely answer oh, the question. Oh, I thought that was clear. No, no, we don't Okay, go ahead, sir. Yes. Shell <coughs> Olga at Uppsala University uh, in Sweden here. Uh, our university is uh, very much involved in energy research, and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, wave power, uh, solar power, and uh, wind, and everything, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, of course, very important that uh, universities get funding for the research, and uh, also long-time commitment in research. Uh, one benefit for the society is that scientists are publishing results in scientific papers. So when they get results, it can be used by others, and uh, they, they other can get benefit from the research that you do at the university. And uh, compared to a company where you lock in the results in the company to just be for them to be useful for the future. So uh, yes, I agree that there should be much, much more research money coming to the university, especially in energy research, because that will make the energy market to expand much faster compared to that individual companies put that money into the research. Thanks very much indeed for that. Um, yes, Mark. Maybe I have one last slide. I just want because I think that there's a there's a game-changing thing that we really should uh, should 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 look at, and this is, this revolves around models to help us think about transparent uh, policy development. Let me just shoot off to the, there. Here we go. Here's a man. One of the things that the British government has done recently, which I think is incredibly sensible, is develop something that they call a, a climate calculator, and this is a transparent way of having a look at how these subsidies fit together, how technologies fit together. Have a look at the implications. If we want to go for more, more nuclear, what does it mean for um, uh, imports of gas from Russia? If we want to have a look at more renewables, what does it mean for uh, balancing services and so on? And I think this is a space where we really need to think long and hard. And, and, it, and it comes back to the, uh, uh, the, 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 the point made a second ago in your your question about uh, universities. I think there are two different types of uh, research that needs to happen. One is on developing a clear, open, transparent policy-making process. I was, uh, yep. briefly, clear, open, transparency, policy-making service. So we, so we can see in the future what potential markets might be there. If you see a market where not only can you sell green kilowatt hours, but you can sell green balancing services too, because at the moment we just, we just focus on the kilowatt hours. The balancing services can be as dirty as they want to be. Okay. Then we can have a look at develop, so that's one set of research. The next set of research which it would inform is what kind of technologies can we develop? It's very easy to develop a concentrating solar thermal power plant with extra storage to provide spinning and fast reserve. At the moment, there's limited development in that area because we've not looked at the potential market models that are out there. Thanks Thank very much. And finally, um, Stefan Derle, you, you, had, uh, you, you were going to show us a slide and make an extra point, and you were extremely restrained and, um, and constructive by not taking up your full time. So I'd like to give you the last word if oh, you want to uh, come to that slide or, or, or just say something else. Yeah, there is one slide. Indeed, we could have a look. Could you just scroll ahead? <clears throat> I say stop when we are there. Ah, this is here. I'm so, sorry. Okay. That one? No. Where is the, that one? So <clears throat> just let me make some other points. I mean, I think we, we could all agree to the point that electricity is the backbone of a well-developed industrial society. And, <clears throat> and of course, I absolutely agree with you that uh, some of the market opportunities are services. There's no point about it. But I think, first of all, we have to deliver the backbone, and then out of the backbone, we make the services. And so just to, to, to give you some uh, examples, we made a test in the city of Lausanne with smart metering. And <clears throat> the, the result was 2% uh, of uh, savings of, of electricity, because people just don't want to be busy with managing 
this themselves. They just didn't do that. I don't know, maybe in the near future it will change, but they didn't. So there, this is an interesting area for, for research, of course. And, and another point here is, of course, if we talk about electricity, we still talk about large infrastructure. And large infrastructure needs large investments. And now the question is, is this the business of everybody, or is this the business of well-developed industry with the know-how and the, uh, the capital to, uh, able to invest? And on the, on the end, uh, to invest in research as well. I'd just like to give you two examples. I mean, uh, wind power. As I told you, I'm in wind power as well, and I just had a talk to the Minister of Energy and, uh, and Construction of the Land Brandenburg in Germany, and we talked about the onshore capabilities of wind, because the uh, possible land for wind onshore was reduced by about 80% from 2002 to 2014. And the question here is, because this is of, of intervenience of the Greens and, and everybody for uh, protection of nature, then the answer was uh, go offshore. But now there is the point. Offshore is, again, <clears throat> it's very large infrastructure with very high investment. To go offshore, <clears throat> you have to have a company with at least 10 billion balance sheet, otherwise you better don't go into it because of the high risk and, 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 and the maintenance cost and so on. I don't say that offshore is not an opportunity, but it is not an opportunity for small companies on the, uh, <clears throat> on the today's market. We, we have planned, you know? So there we have a, we have an, a tendency uh, into two directions. So the, the, the first idea to develop a small industry and small in to come into the grid, of course, is a good idea. But when we reduce uh, the possibilities to uh, invest onshore and we go offshore, then this part of the market is not anymore a valid market player because this is business for large companies. And again, uh, hydro was mentioned. Hydro, if you, if you build a hydro power plant, you have to think 60 or 80 years ahead. Your business model is 60 years at least. Now, just tell me how companies are going to build a business model for 60 years on a market with changing on a daily basis. And just to, to give you this slide here and, and to reflect on this slide, this is Briefly. 2012. This is the, the infeed of, of wind and, and solar power. <clears throat> so I don't say, this is what we face. So this has to be managed. So and this means there are two ways to manage this, either with a strong base load backbone or with a strong storage capacities. So again, an interesting field for, for research. So one storage capacity might be batteries, another possibility might be, might be hydrogen. So we don't know what the future will bring, but if you look at this, I mean, this, this, cannot be, this cannot be the future. This is not handable. And if you look at the crits, for example, the crits are not built for the business case we have today. The crit was actually a downstream construction. Yeah. Now we are feeding in upstream. Yeah? So again, this, this is, so we have a, a lot of, of uh, um, challenges and opportunities uh, to go into. But what, I, what my major statement is, I would say uh, large EVUs are maybe not so bad as they are have been. Uh, large what? Large EVUs and power producers okay. yeah, are maybe not so bad for such a market as they had been, uh, let's say, uh, drawn in the past. Because this is industry, and it's large industry, and it needs large investments. Very good. Well, thanks very much for reminding us that in the end, if you want big changes, you need big money.